two years ago, I asked a question on a now abandoned pet enthusiast Facebook group called Dog People United. Hi everyone, long time lurker, first time poster. There's been something kind of freaky going on with my dog lately. I can't afford a vet, so I'm hoping some kind soul out there in the Zuckerverse can shed some light on the situation for me. My dog's a nine-year-old Shih Tzu mix. His name's Puff. Up until like a week ago, he was a peppy, happy dog. But all of a sudden, he changed. He's quieter now, and he doesn't run to greet me when I come through the door anymore. He just sort of hides and watches me. And he's suddenly weirdly obsessed with water. He spent the last four days sitting in my neighbor's pond or his water dish. I don't know, this might be nothing. He is getting old. I wouldn't even be freaking out about this if it weren't for this really creepy look in his eyes he got about the same time. The best I can describe it, his eyes are like marbles. Oh, and yesterday, he came in the house limping. I managed to grab him and get a look at his back right leg. He didn't seem to be cut or anything. There was no blood. Just this weird, whitish goo all over him. Any tips or advice? Horrible word choice aside, that gives you an idea of what was freaking me out about my dog. His shift from loving and energetic to skulking and reserved. His opaque, depthless eyes and that thick, glue-colored slime I found on his leg. I'd adopted Puff seven months before from an aunt of a friend who could no longer take care of him. At the time, I was 24 and had just started a PhD program in psychology at UCLA. My advisor taught Psych 101 during the summer intercession at a junior college in his hometown, a small city called Porterville. That summer, 2018, he offered me a job as his teaching assistant. The pay was shit, but as I'd be required to teach freshman psychology at UCLA starting in the fall, the experience would be worth its weight in gold. Besides, what else was I going to do with my break? Live with my parents in Arcadia and sleep in my high school bedroom? Go back to my old summer job at the mall behind the register at Forever 21? My favorite thing about Porterville, dirt cheap rent. After a year of paying out the ass to share a Westwood dorm, scrolling through the Craigslist room shares page for Tulare County was a glimpse into heaven. Porterville isn't a small town by any standards, but it's rather isolated, surrounded on all sides by golden, grassy hills and endless farmland. I ended up renting a guest house from a middle-aged couple in an unincorporated neighborhood outside Porterville, off a two-lane highway. The wife's mother had lived in the little cabin on their huge property for a decade, but she'd passed away the year before, and as the couple's two sons had long since departed for larger cities, they had nothing but space. For 400 a month, I got essentially my own house with a washer and dryer, a pool, and a porch with a view of the unblemished foothills and miles of wild, weeded badlands. And Puff, who'd only ever lived in an apartment, now had an acre's worth of backyard to romp. Puff was an impossibly friendly ball of curly fur who loved attention, particularly mine. He was gray all over, except for patches of black fur over both his eyes and ears, and a small black spot on his back. Very cute. Though he was not a young dog anymore, he had the energy of a puppy. As soon as his black eyes fell on any human he knew, he would bound over enthusiastically and jump against their legs until they relented and picked him up. He had a mischievous streak as well. Within weeks, he'd explored every inch of that acre of backyard. His new life as an outdoor pet gave him a taste for adventure. He took to digging under the fences, and I would often come home from work to find him in the neighbor's yard, sniffing at their son's rabbit hutch. He never did any harm to the rabbits, and they soon learned to ignore him. After all, the bunnies were roughly the same size he was. In my Facebook post, I used the term suddenly more than once. I'll admit my pre-grad school diction needed improvement, but even now, I can't think of a better word. At 4.30 p.m., June 30th, 
2018. I could hear Puff's sharp little claws banging against the gate that led to my guest house as soon as I shut my car door. Small, furry legs ready to leap ecstatically into my arms, just like every day before. His paws were wet and muddy that day. He dug his way out of my yard to nap under Mr. Ferguson's giant oak tree. Mr. Ferguson, while taking a weed whacker to the bushy growth at the far end of his property, had inadvertently severed a sprinkler head, dumping 150 gallons of water into his backyard before DWP shut it off. Puff wasn't the biggest fan of getting wet, but he tolerated before giving up his favorite sleeping spot. When my t-shirt and jeans were sufficiently covered with dirt, I put Puff down. He ran to his empty food dish and looked up at me with practiced, accusing, forlorn eyes until I filled it with fresh kibble, which he inhaled. Later, as I lay on the couch with the latest journal of American psychology, he curled up beside me and fell asleep with his head on my feet. He knew he wasn't allowed on the couch, but the little hairball had figured out I was a sucker for how cute he looked when he slept. At 6.30 the next morning, July 1st, 2018, his high-pitched whining and incessant pawing at my mattress woke me up a good 15 minutes before my alarm was set to. I crawled out of bed and groggily stumbled to my door, through which he bolted as soon as it was sufficiently open, just like every day before. At 4.33 p.m., July 1st, 2018, I opened the gate without interference and found the backyard empty. No big issue. I looked at Puff's well-used tunnel under the north fence and assumed he was frolicking in an adjacent yard. None of the neighbors minded. They'd all fallen in love with him. I refilled his food dish and went inside to grade papers. Several hours later, my female landlord knocked on my door. Mr. Ferguson called. Puff was still in his backyard. It was dark, and while he enjoyed the company my little fur ball provided, he thought I might be worried. Mr. Ferguson lived two doors down. He was about 70 years old, widowed, and though not the friendliest guy on the planet, always pleasant with me. I don't know what possessed him to take that weed whacker to the thick, meter-high crabgrass snaking around his chain-link fence. It was about as effective as removing a handful of sand from the beach. His sprawling property had clearly not played host to a garden tool in decades. Besides the giant oak tree, his yard was home to piles of rotten wood, an old shed destroyed by a long past thunderstorm and never rebuilt, an empty trailer used in theory for storage, but in reality, a cockroach sanctuary, a broken down tractor, so rusted and weather beaten it had become a part of the ecosystem, and seemingly every species of weed, vine, and other evasive flora this side of the Amazon rainforest. In the weeks or so since he severed that sprinkler head, his backyard had begun to resemble a swamp. The property was bowl-shaped, a shallow concavity at the center, approximately nine feet in diameter, with sides sloped so gently he barely noticed the irregularity, until, 150 gallons of water gushed out of the cracked pipe and turned the area into a pond. Several days of heavy rain had kept the muddy pool from evaporating. Mr. Ferguson didn't have a porch lamp, so I found myself looking for my dog by nothing but the dim light emanating through his back door. Any time previously I had found Puff in a neighbor's yard, he would jovially reveal himself as soon as he caught my scent. Not this time. I called his name, then called again, nothing. I saw movement, my eyes adjusted to the light, and I recognized Puff's floppy ears and nappy fur. He was sitting in the pond. I took two steps towards him and saw that he was almost fully submerged in the murky water. This was strange. Puff hated baths and avoided our pool like the plague. I called him again, and when he didn't come, marched out to grab him, soaking my shoes. He darted away from my approaching form. He's been there for hours, said Mr. Ferguson from the doorway. I've been here since noon. The little guy hasn't moved. I lunged at Puff again. Again, he cowered, backpedaling deeper into the water. Finally, he seemed to comprehend that it was time to go. He begrudgingly waded out and stood in front of me, 
as though awaiting orders. I reached to pick him up, and for the third time, he recoiled. Fine, he doesn't want to be picked up. I led the way through Mr. Ferguson's gate. Puff followed a few feet behind me. We continued like this all the way to my guest house. I expected Puff to scarf down the kibble I'd set out for him. It was nearly nine. He should have been starving. But he didn't even look at the food. Instead, he plopped himself down in his water bowl. He sat motionless for about a minute, until he realized that my standing by the door, holding it open, meant I wanted him to go inside. I was tempted to leave him in the yard, but didn't want him getting out into the street in the dark. Whatever, a neighbor probably fed him, and it had been an unseasonably warm day. He was probably hot. I made a mental note to get his fur trimmed, and, deciding to put off cleaning up Puff's dirty paw prints until morning, lay down in bed to read. But Puff didn't jump up beside me to snuggle, as he usually did. I saw his short legs and broom-like tail vanish into the dark bathroom, where he stayed for the rest of the night. At 7.30 a.m., July 2nd, 2018, I awoke with a start. My alarm hadn't gone off, and I had to be at work in 30 minutes. I was tossing my dirty hair into a ponytail, ready to grab my bag and run for it, when I realized my more reliable, furry alarm clock had also failed to wake me. Where was that dog? I called his name. Nothing. I did a lap of our three-room home. Puff was nowhere to be found. In too much of a hurry to look for him, I took off for the college, fully expecting to come home to a puddle of dog pee and Puff pawing at the door. At 4.28 p.m., July 2nd, 2018, I came home to an empty yard, as expected. Less expectedly, I came home to an empty house. No dog pee, no Puff. Full bowl of untouched kibble. Then, I made a discovery that demonstrated just how strange the whole situation was. A set of well-defined paw prints led from the door to the bathroom. This made sense. It was the path Puff took as we returned home from Mr. Ferguson's yard last night. But there was another, lighter set of paw prints leading back the other way, from the bathroom to the door. I opened the door and looked out. The paw prints continued, fainter, across my concrete porch. Puff had been inside and had somehow gotten out. Somehow. Had I left the door open in my haste to leave in the morning? Possibly. But it was definitely closed when I'd come home. And Puff, with no opposable thumbs, could not have possibly closed the door behind him and locked it. My head spun for about a minute before I came up with a rational explanation. Maybe I'd left the door open in the morning and my landlords, who had a set of keys to the guest house, had found it that way and closed it. Or maybe they'd seen or heard Puff pawing at the door and let him out, locking the door behind them. I shrugged it off. At 6.38 p.m., I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. It was Mr. Ferguson. He'd gotten my cell number from my landlady. Puff was in his pond again. By the fading sunlight, I saw that Mr. Ferguson's pond was evaporating. Its circumference had receded, leaving a ring of dark-colored earth. The events of the last night were repeated. I called. Puff refused to leave the shallow water. I reached out to grab him. He recoiled. Finally, he followed me, like an obedient soldier, home, where he ignored his food, sat in his water bowl, and retreated to the shadows of the guest house when he saw I wasn't going to close the door until he went inside. I closed the door and made sure to lock it. I stayed up late that night, lying on my couch, grading essays. I lost track of Puff, only to find him several hours later when I went to make a pot of coffee. He'd managed to nudge open the door to the mold lace cabinet under the sink and lay there, nestled against the pipes. Strange, this had never been one of his hiding places. I knelt to pull him out. I didn't want him to consume the dish soap or cleaning products I stored there. He withdrew from my outstretched hands and nipped at me. I pulled back, flabbergasted. I'd never seen him so much as growl at another creature, much less try to bite me. I looked him directly in the eyes, except they weren't his eyes. There was something different about those pitch-black orbs 
no light, no recognition, like doll's eyes. It's hard to explain, but it freaked me out. Fine, I snapped. Stay there. As I stood up, I noticed an unfamiliar odor mingling with the scent of my cheap coffee. It brought to mind a fast food dumpster. I remembered the Carl's Jr. bag I tossed a few days ago and made a mental note to take out the garbage. Before going to sleep, I double-checked the door and set my alarm for 6.45. I didn't hear Puff move all night and didn't check to see whether or not he was still under the sink. At 6.50 a.m., July 3rd, 2018, Puff was missing, again, and a faint trail of muddied paw prints matching the one I wiped up the day before led out the door and onto the patio. There was also fresh smudges of dirt on my sliding glass door and its black plastic handle, as though Puff had attempted to open it himself. I threw on jeans and a sweater and jogged to Mr. Ferguson's house. He was fully dressed when he opened the door, as he was the type of elderly man who woke with the sun. That day, he'd been roused at 4.30 by a wet plop from the backyard. Yeah, this is getting tedious. Puff was in his pond, which was being worked on by nature slowly and surely. It was now barely four feet in diameter, and I guessed, less than a foot deep at its apex. With Mr. Ferguson's permission, I left him there. That night, I started keeping a journal. Here are a few entries. 10.30 p.m., July 3rd, 2018. Went to get Puff from Mr. Ferguson's house. Pond is shrinking, only about three feet across. Managed to grab hold of him for a minute before he squirmed away. He feels heavier and squishier than before. I think he's gained weight. Still hasn't touched his kibble, and neighbor's probably feeding him table scraps. He went and hid in the bathroom when we got home. I sat down at the kitchen table to do some work. 45 minutes or so later, looked up to see him sitting under the counter my TV is on. Calm, quiet, just staring at me, watching me. His eyes are really freaking me out. They look dead, like marbles. I've really got to find out who's feeding him. I took out the trash, but the house still smells like some awful combination of rancid fish and McDonald's dumpster. I think he's been ripping some really nasty farts. 11.45 p.m., July 3rd, 2018. Really interested to see how he's getting out. Gonna ask the landlady tomorrow. Just set up my laptop webcam to record and put it on my kitchen table so it shows the entire front of the house. Maybe he's found some hole in the floor I don't know about and is getting out some other way. Puff's still under the TV. Hasn't moved all night. 10 a.m., July 4th, 2018. Couldn't find Puff when I woke up. Went to the kitchen to make coffee. Pot was dirty. So I opened the cabinet under the sink to get the dish soap and actually screamed. Puff was curled up under the pipes. I thought he was asleep, but his eyes were wide open. I went to the door and opened it, and he strolled casually out. I watched him head towards the north fence, towards Mr. Ferguson's yard. The weird fish and rotting fast food smell is particularly strong this morning. Watch the video I recorded on my laptop last night. Very weird. At around one, Puff walks on camera from the right, heading for the door. Then he stops and turns around and just looks right at the camera, dead black eyes reflecting the green recording light. I'm sure this is me imagining things, but I could swear the corners of his mouth elevate as though he's smiling. Then he walks off camera in the direction of the kitchen. 5.30 p.m., July 4th, 2018. This is crazy. I went out to run some errands, then went to talk with my landlady. I asked her if she had by any chance let Puff out of my guest house yesterday, or the day before. She says she didn't, and as far as she knew, neither did her husband. Didn't have much to elaborate, because she also says she got a call from Mr. Ferguson. Apparently, he went out at 7, and when he came back at 2, his backyard was completely flooded again. Somebody turned on his hose and left it running for hours at full blast. He lost something like 200 gallons of water. He wanted her to tell me Puff's okay, he's in his backyard. He's been submerging himself in water all day. 
Mr. Ferguson thinks it was a prank by the local teenagers, but my landlady's convinced he turned on the water himself and forgot about it. If a stranger was in the yard, Puff would have barked up a storm and she would have heard it. Except, now that I think about it, I haven't heard Puff bark in days. 11 p.m., July 4th, 2018. I put off going to get Puff from Mr. Ferguson's for hours. I don't know. Something about that dog is seriously creeping me out. At about 9.30, Mr. Ferguson knocked on my door, a squirming, clawing Puff under his arm. For a minute, I didn't want to open the door. I might seriously be scared of my dog. Mr. Ferguson was nice about it, but I could tell he's getting annoyed. He commented on how heavy Puff's getting and how bad he smells. He says he hasn't been feeding him anything and has no idea who might be. He's right. The nasty smell is stronger tonight. And there's something else mixed in with it. Mold, maybe. When I got close to Puff, I could tell the rancidness was coming from him. After Mr. Ferguson left, Puff started for the bathroom. He was limping. It looked like his right front paw was hurt. I grabbed him and despite his jerking around and noiselessly nipping at my hand, managed to get a good look at his leg. There was no blood, just a thick glob of white goo. I scraped off the glob before he wriggled away. The substance was cool and sticky, opaque, white, about the color and texture of school glue. I had no idea how this related to his injured paw, so I washed it off. I set up my laptop camera again. If Puff's still limping in the morning, I'll take him to the vet. I can't afford it, but this is getting a little too weird for me. 10 a.m., July 5th, 2018. I just watched the footage I recorded last night. What the hell? I'm writing this from a diner in town. I don't want to be at home right now. The smell is terrible, and I'm sure now there's something really effed up and twisted going on. When I woke up, Puff wasn't anywhere in the house, and the front door was locked. I checked everywhere for him. When I looked in the cabinet under the sink where he'd hid the other day, I saw a pile of something white. It was a pile of maggots. When I went to watch what I recorded, I realized my laptop had been turned off. I nearly punched myself in the face. I knew exactly what happened. The night before, distracted by the neighbors setting off legally dubious fireworks, I must have momentarily forgotten my plans to surveil Puff and instinctively press the off button. I turned my computer on to delete what should have been a short, useless video. I was wrong. I'd recorded around two hours of footage the night before. At about the hour 55 mark, around 1 a.m., Puff walked into view, heading for the door. But again, he stopped and turned to the camera. He cocked his head, and this time, I'm sure he smiled. I could see his teeth. Then he walked towards the camera and under the table. The video shook as though the table was being rattled. Then something large and gray took up most of the frame. Then the camera was completely obscured, and then the video ended. Did my tiny dog climb to the top of a four-foot-high table, then willfully turn off my laptop because he knew I was recording him? How is that even possible? House pets don't plot or sabotage or try and cover up for the shit they do. And the maggots and the smell and the strange white goo and those eyes. His effing dead plastic cold eyes. I don't want to go home. I don't want to go to Mr. Ferguson's yard to find Puff soaking in that murky, scum-covered pond. I don't want to look up to find him staring at me, studying me, or messing with me. I don't know. There's too much I don't get. I can't explain. I didn't go home that night. In fact, I never entered the guest house alone ever again. I told my landlords my hours at the college had been cut and I could no longer afford rent, and they sympathetically offered me my deposit back, despite my late notice. I didn't take it. I put in my two weeks notice with my advisor and told him I needed to go home to take care of a sick grandmother, and he assured me he understood. Several days later, assisted by my advisor, 
I packed all my belongings into cardboard Home Depot boxes, loaded up my car, and stayed in a hotel until my two weeks were over, and I left Porterville for good. I lived with my parents for the rest of the summer. I told them Puff had been hit by a car. In the fall, I moved back into a Westwood dorm. I shared a small, two-bedroom apartment with three quiet, studious undergrads, and we shared a complex with a mixture of graduates and undergrads, some of whom were always loud and frequently drunk. But I soon realized I didn't mind the constant company as much as I had the year before. In fact, I felt safer knowing I wasn't alone. When my roommates were in the apartment, I could concentrate on my schoolwork, instead of constantly scanning the area for the black, lifeless, opaque eyes I could still feel resting on me. Which brings me to the obvious question. What happened to Puff? I sat in that diner for hours, grading tests at first, then resigning myself to the fact I was too on edge to read coherent sentences, watching harmless web videos that had nothing to do with paranormal shit or pets. I knew I'd get the call from Mr. Ferguson any moment, and I was terrified. But that call never came. I spent the night at a motel, and in the morning, finally sacked up and called Mr. Ferguson myself. He hadn't seen Puff since the 4th. He thought he heard a bout of splashing in his pond early the next morning, but assumed that since Puff was home with me, it was a raccoon or squirrel, and didn't bother getting up to check. Then I called my landlady. She hadn't seen Puff either, but had been intending to call me to see if I could be of any assistance in easing a perplexity that had plagued her for the last 24 hours. Apparently, the Johansson's little boy was very upset. They were the family who lived right next to us, the ones who owned two rabbits. They'd woken up the previous morning to find both rabbits missing and a gaping hole in the bottom of their hutch. I wasn't to worry, I was assured. Puff was off the hook. The mesh that formed the floor of the hutch had been cut with wire cutters. Puff's lack of opposable thumbs deemed such a task impossible. The Johansons believed it was the work of the same prankster who turned on Mr. Ferguson's water the day before, and my landlady wondered if I'd seen or heard anything. I hadn't. Puff was still unaccounted for when I returned, for the last time, with my advisor to the guest house to pack up my belongings and I made no further effort to find him. The rancid, fishy odor had greatly diminished, but not completely dissipated. And I found myself glancing nervously over my shoulders and flinching whenever a closed door was opened. I left my dish soap and cleaning supplies for the next tenant to find. I didn't dare approach the moldy, maggot-infested cabinet under the sink. The Johansson's rabbits, according to my landlady, briefly reappeared. Mrs. Gonzalez, who lived between us and Mr. Ferguson, found them lingering in her yard when she'd come out to turn off her sprinklers. However, the next morning, Henry Johansson woke to find them missing yet again. This time, the door to their hutch had been left wide open. No big loss, he'd said. Somehow, during the short period after the rabbits had been recaptured and before they vanished for good, his son Jeremy developed a strong, almost manic aversion to the creatures. He seemed terrified of the things, strange, since their care had previously been his favorite pastime. I never found out what became of Mr. Ferguson and his erroneously created pond. Away from Tulare County and the guest house, with the relative assurance my eerily possessed pet was lost for good, it was easy to forget the terror the situation had inspired. I rarely thought about it, and when I did, I was sure I'd overlooked a rational explanation for everything, even Puff's seeming ability to walk through locked doors. The guest house was old. It was entirely possible he'd found some dog-sized breach in the flooring that led outside. I deleted the videos I'd recorded and neglected to return to Dog People United on Facebook to see if anyone had responded to my post. This year, my third year of graduate school, I secured part-time work as a counselor's assistant at a small private elementary academy. If it hadn't been for an offhand conversation I had with the little boy at the school, a couple days before the state was shut down for coronavirus, I probably wouldn't be writing this now. He was in my office for overturning his desk in a fit of rage. It was because he was sad, he told me. His doggy was acting weird. 
My stomach dropped. For some reason, those words, phrased that way, kicked my fight-or-flight reflex into high gear. As it turned out, his golden retriever was pregnant. But for the first time in two years, I wondered what exactly had happened to Puff. The situation was now distant enough where curiosity won out over apprehension. Last night, bored, I googled the Dog People United Facebook group. The page is no longer active, but the questions posted and the responses to them were still visible. I found mine in minutes and saw six people had responded. Three consisted of some variation on, he's probably sick, you should take him to the vet. One suggested I switch to a different brand of dog food. And one was a solicitation for a new variety of dentabone. The sixth is the reason I'm sharing this story. It was from an otherwise empty sock puppet account called Madison B. And it had been published three weeks after I submitted the post. Here is the text in its entirety. Olivia Bertrand, kill that thing, kill it. Then drain whatever large body of water it's been soaking itself in. This is not a joke. I don't care how you do it, just make sure it's dead. It won't look like you'd think a slaughtered animal should look. Don't be alarmed, it's not an animal anymore. I know this sounds weird and I can't fully explain on Facebook, but it's of utmost importance that the thing is dead and the water is gone. Do it as soon as possible. Be careful, the thing is stronger and smarter than you think. And do not, under any circumstances, get in the water. Do not let it coax or drag you into the water. Do not go anywhere near the pond or lake or whatever until it's been completely drained. Then make sure it stays drained. Please, for your own sake, do what I say. I repeat, this is not a joke. Does anyone know this person? What she or he can't fully explain over the internet? Anyone else want to take a crack at it? Is this some new variety of internet hoax I'm not aware of? Please, anyone with additional information, comment below.